France in the 1420s. A teenage girl claims she hears voices, words only she can hear. Her name is Joan of Arc, and she says they come from God. It doesn't matter whether God had a mission for her or not. She believed it. Joan embarks on her holy quest to defeat the English and see the French king crowned. Divine messenger, witch, or warrior, capable of transcending extreme pain and suffering. How could this 19-year-old girl have accomplished all this? Searching for answers, historians, neurologists, and religious psychologists examine her extraordinary life as we open the mystery files on Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc, patron saint of France and national hero. The story of Joan has been embellished over the centuries, causing the truth of this young woman's life to become obscured by legend. Rachel Gibbons has studied Joan and medieval history for over 20 years. She is a saint, she's a knight, she's a heretic, she's a witch, she's a feminist champion, She's a prophet. Examining each of her miraculous acts in detail, scientists now believe it may be possible to reveal what lies behind Joan's deeds in life and at death. The investigation starts here, in Domremy La Pucelle, 250 kilometers east of Paris. Around 1428, this family home, the church, and these streets are the setting for Joan's first and most enduring mystery. It is here that Joan makes a choice from which she steps out of obscurity and into legend. She leaves home at the age of just 16. Making the decision to set out almost on her own from her family village at a point when many people would never spend a night away from home is quite a remarkable thing for anyone to do in this period, but certainly for a girl like Joan of Arc. Coming from a rural family, at this time, it's a radical choice, sparked by an extraordinary claim. Joan says that since the age of 13, she has been hearing voices in her head. And she believes these voices come directly from God. Some modern experts argue it shows Joan was a schizophrenic and insane. Psychologist Dr. Miguel Farias thinks otherwise. A major distinction to be made is between people who hear voices and have a serious psychological condition and people who hear voices but have normal lives. <laughs> there is no historical record to suggest that Joan was ever classed as mad. As a child, she was apparently able to function normally within society. Dr. Farias believes the voices could be thoughts buried deep in her unconscious mind. From a purely psychological point of view, we can think that she had a kind of personality disposition which allowed her to perceive things from her unconscious, which she interpreted as, as voices. Because of the Christian beliefs of her time, she reasons that these voices are messages from God. This kind of perception is in fact not unusual in the 15th century. During Joan of Arc's lifetime, there are possibly dozens of 
visionaries or prophets at large in France. Not two or three, not hundreds. It's something that's very unusual, but definitely not unique either. And many of these visionaries are female. Seen as a divine messenger, Joan could have been easily accepted. Her possible faculty for accessing the unconscious and her deep religious fervor could explain her claims to hear the voice of God. But it is the extraordinary actions they inspire that sets Joan apart. Whether people at the time believed in the voices, whether we believe in them now, isn't really that important. What matters is that Joan believed them, and she believed them so strongly that she was prepared to undertake an impossible task, it seems. It is these deeds that are seen by some as miraculous and create the legend of Joan of Arc. And they take place at the very heart of a raging military campaign. The Hundred Years' War, of which Joan's career is a part, is part of a mammoth, long, constant rivalry between England and France. France is divided. On the one side, England, ally with a powerful French noble, the Duke of Burgundy. On the other, the blood heir to the French throne, Charles VII, who does not want to lose his inheritance. The country is split, with the English and Burgundians holding the north and the French the south. The frontier between them is the Loire River. Joan of Arc comes onto the scene at a particularly low point for the French in this conflict, perhaps one of the lowest. The English are slowly pushing south into French territory. This is the stage onto which Joan of Arc walks, negotiating her way into the royal court of Charles VII in March 1429. The voices and her determination would have intrigued the king. When Joan presents herself to the court, it is the relief of Orleans that she claims as her mission. Orleans is the front line of the English-French conflict. The English armies have reached Orleans and know that to go any further, they must take this incredibly important and strategically significant town. The English have laid siege for seven months. Some historians speculate that Charles VII permits Joan to go to Orleans with reinforcements because he is eager to accept anything that might help. And she is welcomed by those militia because her presence is seen as divine legitimacy of the French cause. The legend of Joan as the great armored soldier is born. Joan is said to have achieved a miracle here in Orléans by ending the crushing siege and forcing the English into retreat. Military historian Kelly de Vries reveals that the reality is very, very different. The English don't feel like they have enough forces to go up against the French, and the French don't try to go up against the English stronghold. De Vries's interpretation lies in the detailed analysis of the events leading up to Joan's arrival. So the English arrive at the Loire. Most of the cities that they come up against, they simply surrender, but the Orleanais do not. The English do not expect the citizens of Orléans to fight back. So much so that they only bring a small force of around 4,000 men to annex the city. With this limited manpower, the English leader, Thomas Montague, focuses their attack on the southern fort of Turel. Behind lies the only bridge across the Loire River into the city. It is here that the Orléans make an extraordinarily bold move. They destroy the bridge, cutting off the English advance. When the Orléans put up their fight, the English have to besiege them. But the English do not have sufficient men to surround the whole city and stop supplies going in and out. On top of that, they suffer a major setback. Thomas Montague is killed in a bizarre incident during the early days of the siege. It's kind of a gruesome story. He um, goes to a window and a French cannonball hits the window 
and it destroys his face. It, it kills him and removes the effect of leadership on, on the English side. Unlike the legendary story, Joan does not approach Orléans when the city is on the brink of destruction at the hands of the English. The English can't win. The Orléanais can't fight them off. It is a stalemate. Brain Games is back, and this season there's twice as many illusions in games. We'll open new doors to your mind. We'll turn you sideways and throw you completely off balance. Nothing will be as it appears until we show you the whole picture. That's the beauty of how your brain works. We're going to blow your mind like never before on the new season of Brain Games. Every Wednesday at these times on National Geographic HD. What are you doing? Oh, I'm signaling the neighbors. Are they signaling back? Well, not yet. What are you trying to say? It's Morse code for, can I come over and watch TV? Oh, all right, I get it. Come on. Your brain is bored. You know they don't even know Morse code, right? Hey, the neighbors just invited us over for TV night. Woo! What? 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 So give it something to look forward to with smart and fun shows right here on National Geographic HD. Experience a new form of space. A space that combines a beautiful shape with exceptional room inside. Delivering unrivaled dynamism and freedom for your dreams, experiences and life. The all-new BMW 3 Series Gran Turismo. Beauty and space redefined. Roll the dice and commit a crime in Vegas, you'll lose more than money. It makes you feel like a terrible person the day you let him down. When party people mix with hardcore cons. If you're a weak individual, they're going to pry on you. Survival is a new reason to stay up all night in Vegas. I don't want to be passed around. I don't want to be held down. I don't want that stuff to happen. Behind bars in Sin City, no gamble ever pays off. This is a no-win situation in here. What happens here stays locked up here. Hard time. Thursday nights at these times on National Geographic HD. Joan's arrival with more troops tips the balance in favor of the Orléanais and the French. They attack, striking at the English in the fort of Curel head on and succeed in driving them to defeat. Rather than a miraculous victory, De Vries believes the English were no great threat. Everybody wants to believe that the English could have swept through the rest of France and Joan of Arc is the determining factor and they're not doing so. But I don't think they can win. While the victory at Orléans may be less than extraordinary, a reputed miracle takes place on the battlefield that cannot be so easily explained. Joan is hit by an arrow, which penetrates 15 centimeters into her neck and shoulder region. There was tons of blood. It was thought that Joan might have been killed by this. An apparent fatal wound in battle. And yet, just a short time later, she is back in the action. And the fact that she comes back very quickly, seemingly unhurt by this wound, has been used as a miracle. However, there is no record of exactly where the wound is sighted or how life-threatening it actually would have been. Analyzing armor from the time, Dr. Tobias Capwell is searching for clues. This is actually a very difficult thing to get close to because no complete armor from the time of Joan of Arc survives today. This tomb effigy in a rural English church around 105 kilometers northwest of London dates from the early 15th century and is one of the best surviving representations of Joan's type of armor. The plate armor that Joan is wearing is very good protection against arrows. So the fact that she suffers a substantial uh, puncturing injury 
implies to me that she was hit in a weak point. Capwell thinks he might have found this weak point. The breastplate that she's wearing comes up from her underarm and goes across her shoulder on this kind of line. The shoulder defense that she's wearing probably runs along a similar parallel line, but the edges don't quite meet. There's a gap. So if she was standing at the bottom of a siege ladder and an arrow is shot from the top of the wall, it comes down and strikes her in that gap. That's a bad injury, but it's not a fatal injury. Capwell's theory suggests Joan's survival is less surprising. However, her wound is still much more than just a scratch. At one of the UK's leading research hospitals, neuroscientist Dr. Katja Wich is analyzing the effects of religious belief on pain. The arrow went in for six inches. We would certainly expect that that should be, that should be painful, very painful. Dr. Wich thinks the answer to how Joan coped with this pain may lie inside her head. We usually think that pain is what happens to the body on the physical side. But we know now that it's a bit more complex than that. It's not just what is happening on the physical side, but very much what we make out of it on a psychological level. Wieck has teamed up with psychologist Dr. Miguel Farias to investigate how someone could alter their awareness of pain without physically taking it away. Dr. Farias conducts tests on the psychology of religion and has a specific question that focuses their investigation. See, to what an extent religious belief can influence not just your perception of the world, but even how you feel pain and to what an extent you feel pain. Using a magnetic resonance imaging machine, or MRI, to scan brain activity, their experiment will measure the effect of faith and belief on a person's perception of the pain they are receiving. 24 volunteers are tested. Half are Catholic, half atheist non-believers. Participants are shown two different paintings. One of the Virgin Mary, the other a non-religious painting by Leonardo da Vinci. For each image, they will be given a small electric shock. They are then asked to rate how painful each shock is. Dr. Wieck not only gathers the participants' reactions, but also the MRI scans of their brain activity throughout the experiment. The results reveal a consistent pattern and a possible answer to how Joan may have managed the pain of her wound. The first thing we noticed was that the religious um, participants really reported less pain, but only when they looked at the image of the Virgin Mary. The blue cross shows the area of the brain that is linked to pain reduction. In the atheist group, no activity is recorded in this area. In the Catholic group, however, it's a different story. Yeah, you can see we do get it, yeah. They engage in a mechanism that is represented here in this little brain region that helps them to dampen down the pain. Given Joan's deep religious conviction, the conclusions could explain her quick recovery. She found strength in, in her belief to really suppress the pain also on a physical level. And it could at least point towards what might have been going on in her brain while she experienced that wound and uh, she kept fighting. The experiment has shown how Joan could have been capable of reducing her physical pain purely through faith. It is this unswerving belief that seems to drive her forward as she sees her next mission completed. Charles VII being crowned at Rheim. Its cathedral is the traditional site of all French coronations. Crowning Charles legitimizes his claim for the throne over the rival English bid. The ceremony takes place on the 17th of July, 1429, two months after the victory at Orléans. But historians view the coronation as Joan's last great victory. It's 
very difficult for anybody in the modern era to imagine the level of self-belief and the potency of the experience that Joan of Arc must have gone through. But in the end, it's that self-belief and the drive that leads eventually to her capture and to her death. With the king crowned, rather than returning home, Joan takes on new military missions, including a foolhardy attack on Paris. They fail, and she is captured by the Burgundians around 80 kilometers north of Paris. These French soldiers, loyal to the English, hand Joan over. Her military career ended. The myth of Joan of Arc is that she frees France from English oppression during the Hundred Years' War. But the evidence paints a different picture. The coronation doesn't end the Hundred Years' War, neither does Joan's capture. The war itself doesn't end, finally, until 1453. Joan does not liberate the French, as her legend suggests. The war continues for another 20 years. Her self-belief, once so central to her, now becomes a liability. Taken to Rouen, in English-controlled France, she is tried and convicted by the Catholic Church for heresy. The penalty is being burned alive at the stake. Events in her last days reveal the final extraordinary truth of Joan's abilities. It starts with a moment of doubt. In the shadow of Rouen Abbey Church, Joan repents and denies her voices. After everything she had been through, after all the danger and the difficulties she faced in obedience to those voices, at this final, darkest hour, she renounces them, confessing her sins against the church and God. It may well be that she was afraid, which seems to be a perfectly normal human reaction from anybody, let alone from a 19-year-old girl. She's going to be burned alive. It's impossible not to be afraid of that. But remarkably, she withdraws her confession just a few days later. Yet again, Joan's self-belief dominates her seemingly rational mind. It's that moment of weakness which, in the Christian tradition, makes her be a saint. She was weak at a certain point and she managed to accept that weakness and overcome it. Joan has sealed her own fate. If she had been found not guilty of heresy, if she had not gone back on her abjuration, it's very unlikely we'd ever have heard of her dying as she did, making a sacrifice of herself for what she believed is what brought Joan of Arc to prominence. Joan's story, her entire life, is shaped by her incredible strength of mind. And her death, 22 months after her great triumph of the coronation of a French king, is the final exceptional embodiment of this. According to eyewitness accounts, she does not plead for her life. She simply calls out, Jesus, in a persistent and strong voice, as the flames rise. We have the evidence from the Eastern tradition that people in a, in a highly focused state of meditation did not express any pain, where they seemed to cut off any sort of external stimulation. So we know that it is possible. It is quite extraordinary. Joan's young adult life is dominated by her religious fervor. It seems the psychology of this extreme piety and strength of mind offers an explanation for her legendary miracles. 
But despite this great devotion to her God, it is the Catholic Church that had her burned as a heretic. And it would take nearly 490 years before the same church would finally recognize Joan of Arc as a saint.